Chapter 18 In What Way Princes Must Keep Faith How laudable it is for a prince to keep good faith and live with integrity, and not with astuteness, and everyone knows. Still the experience of our times shows those princes to have done great things who have had little regard for good faith, and have been able by astuteness to confuse men's brains, and who have ultimately overcome those who have made loyalty their foundation. You must know, then, that there are two methods of fighting, the one by law, the other by force. The first method is that of men, the second of beasts. But as the first method is often insufficient, one must have recourse to the second. It is therefore necessary for a prince to know well how to use both the beast and the man. This was covertly taught to rulers by ancient writers who relate how Achilles and many others of those ancient princes were given to Chiron the centaur to be brought up and educated under his discipline. The parable of the semi-animal, semi-human teacher is meant to indicate that a prince must know how to use both natures, and that the one without the other is not durable. A prince being thus obliged to know well how to act as a beast must imitate the fox and the lion, for the lion cannot protect himself from traps, and the fox cannot defend himself from wolves. One must therefore be a fox to recognize traps, and a lion to frighten wolves. Those that wish to be only lions do not understand this. Therefore, a prudent ruler ought not to keep faith when by so doing it would be against his interest, and when the reasons which made him bind himself no longer exist. If men were all good, this precept would not be a good one, but as they are bad, and would not observe their faith with you so you are not bound to keep faith with them, nor have legitimate grounds ever failed a prince who wished to show colorable excuse for the non-fulfillment of his promise. Of this, one could furnish an infinite number of modern examples and show how many times peace has been broken and how many promises rendered worthless by the faithlessness of princes and those that have been best able to imitate the fox have succeeded best. But it is necessary to be able to disguise this character well, and to be a great feigner and dissembler, and men are so simple and so ready to obey present necessities, that one who deceives will always find those who allow themselves to be deceived. I will only mention one modern instance. Alexander the Sixth did nothing else but deceive men. He thought of nothing else and found the occasion for it. No man was ever more able to give assurances or affirmed things with stronger oaths, and no man observed them less. However, he always succeeded in his deceptions, as he well knew this aspect of things. It is not, therefore, Necessary for a prince to have all the above-named qualities, but it is very necessary to seem to have them. I would even be bold to say that to possess them and always to observe them is dangerous, but to appear to possess them is useful. Thus it is well to seem merciful, faithful, humane, sincere, religious, and also to be so, but you must have the mind so disposed that when it is needful to be otherwise, you may be able to change to the opposite qualities. And it must be understood that a prince, and especially a new prince, cannot observe all those things which are considered good in men, being often obliged, in order to maintain the state, to act against faith, against charity, against humanity, and against religion. And, therefore, he must have a mind disposed to adapt itself according to the wind, and as the variations of fortune dictate, and, 
as I said before, not deviate from what is good, if possible, but be able to do evil if constrained. A prince must take great care that nothing goes out of his mouth which is not full of the above-named five qualities, and, to see and hear him, he should seem to be all mercy, faith, integrity, humanity, and religion, and nothing is more necessary than to seem to have this last quality, for men in general judge more by the eyes than by the hands, for every one can see but very few have to feel. Everybody sees what you appear to be, few feel what you are, and those few will not dare to oppose themselves to the many, who have the majesty of the state to defend them, and in the actions of men, and especially of princes, from which there is no appeal, the end justifies the means. Let a prince therefore aim at conquering and maintaining the state, and the means will always be judged honorable and praised by everyone, for the vulgar is always taken by appearances in the issue of the event, and the world consists only of the vulgar, and the few who are not vulgar are isolated when the many have a rallying point in the prince. A certain prince of the present time, whom it is well not to name, never does anything but preach peace and good faith, but he is really a great enemy to both, and either of them, had he observed them, would have lost him state or reputation on many occasions. Chapter 19 That We Must Avoid Being Despised and Hated But as I have now spoken of the most important of the qualities in question, I will now deal briefly and generally with the rest. The prince must, as already stated, avoid those things which will make him hated or despised, and whenever he succeeds in this, he will have done his part, and will find no danger in other vices. He will chiefly become hated, as I said, by being rapacious and usurping the property and women of his subjects which he must abstain from doing, and whenever one does not attack the property or honor of the generality of men, they will live contented, and one will only have to combat the ambition of a few, who can be easily held in check in many ways. He is rendered despicable by being thought changeable, frivolous, effeminate, timid, and irresolute which a prince must guard against as a rock of danger, and so contrive that his actions show grandeur, spirit, gravity, and fortitude. And as to the government of his subjects, let his sentence be irrevocable, and let him adhere to his decisions, so that no one may think of deceiving or cozening him. The prince who creates such an opinion of himself gets a great reputation, and it is very difficult to conspire against one who has a great reputation, and he will not easily be attacked, so long as it is known that he is capable and reverenced by his subjects. For a prince must have two kinds of fear, one internal as regards his subjects, one external as regards foreign powers. From the latter he can defend himself with good arms and good friends and he will always have good friends if he has good arms. And internal matters will always remain quiet, if they are not perturbed by conspiracy, and there is no disturbance from without. And even if external powers sought to attack him, if he has ruled and lived as I have described, he will always, if he stands firm, be able to sustain every shock, as I have shown that Nabus the Spartan did. But with regard to the subjects, if not acted on from outside, it is still to be feared lest they conspire in secret, from which the prince may guard himself well by avoiding hatred and contempt, and keeping the people satisfied with him, which it is necessary to accomplish, as has been related at length. And one of the most potent remedies that a prince has against conspiracies 
is that of not being hated by the mass of the people, for whoever conspires always believes that he will satisfy the people by the death of their prince. But if he thought to offend them by doing this, he would fear to engage in such an undertaking, for the difficulties that conspirators have to meet are infinite. Experience shows that there have been very many conspiracies, but few have turned out well, for whoever conspires cannot act alone and cannot find companions except among those who are discontented. And as soon as you have disclosed your intentions to a malcontent, you give him the means of satisfying himself, for by revealing it he can hope to secure everything he wants, to such an extent that seeing a certain gain by doing this, and seeing on the other hand, only a doubtful one and full of danger, he must either be a rare friend to you or else a very bitter enemy to the prince if he keeps faith with you. And to express the matter in a few seconds, I say that on the side of the conspirator, there is nothing but fear, jealousy, suspicion, and dread of punishment which frightens him. And on the side of the prince, there is the majesty of government the laws, the protection of friends, and of the state which guard him. When to these things is added the goodwill of the people, it is impossible that any one should have the temerity to conspire. For whereas generally a conspirator has to fear before the execution of his plot, in this case, having the people for an enemy, he must also fear after his crime is accomplished, and thus he is not able to hope for any refuge. Numberless instances might be given of this, but I will content myself with one which took place within the memory of our fathers. Mesar Annabale, Bentavogli, Prince of Bologna, ancestor of the present Mesar Annabale, was killed by the Kaneshi, who conspired against him. He left no relations but Maser Giovanni, who was then an infant, but after the murder the people rose up and killed all the Kaneshi. This arose from the popular goodwill that the house of Bentavogli enjoyed at that time, which was so great that, as there was nobody left after the death of Annabelle who could govern the state, the Bolognese hearing that there was one of the Bentavogli family in Florence, who had till then been thought the son of a blacksmith, came to fetch him and gave him the government of the city, and it was governed by him until Maser Giovanni was old enough to assume the government. I conclude, therefore, that a prince need trouble little about conspiracies when the people are well disposed, but when they are hostile and hold him in hatred, then he must fear everything and everybody. Well-ordered states and wise princes have studied diligently not to drive the nobles to desperation and to satisfy the populace and keep it contented, for this is one of the most important matters that a prince has to deal with. Among the kingdoms that are well-ordered and governed in our time is France, and there we find numberless good institutions on which depend the liberty and security of the king. Of these, the chief is the parliament and its authority, because he who established that kingdom, knowing the ambition and insolence of the great nobles, deemed it necessary to have a bit in their mouths to check them. And knowing, on the other hand, the hatred of the mass of the people against the great, based on fear and wishing to secure them, he did not wish to make this the special care of the king, to relieve him of the dissatisfaction that he might incur among the nobles by favoring the people, and among the people by favoring the nobles. He therefore established a third judge that, without direct charge of the king, kept in check the great and favored the lesser people. Nor could any better or more prudent measure have been adopted nor better precaution for the safety of the king in the kingdom, from which another notable rule can be drawn, 
that princes should let the carrying out of unpopular duties devolve on others and bestow favors themselves. I conclude again by saying that a prince must esteem his nobles, but not make himself hated by the populace. It may perhaps seem to some that considering the life and death of many Roman emperors, that they are instances contrary to my opinion, finding that some who always lived nobly and showed great strength of character nevertheless lost the empire or were killed by their subjects who conspired against them. Wishing to answer these objections, I will discuss the qualities of some emperors showing the cause of their ruin, not to be at variance with what I have stated, and I will also meanwhile consider the things to be noted by whoever reads the deeds of these times. I will content myself with taking all these emperors who succeeded to the empire, from Marcus the philosopher to Maximinius, these were Marcus, Commodus his son, Pertinax, Julianus, Severus, Antononius, Caracalla his son, Macrinus, Heliogabalus, Alexander, and Maximinius. And the first thing to note is that whereas other princes have only to contend against the ambition of the great and the insolence of the people, the Roman emperors had a third difficulty, that of having to support the cruelty and avarice of the soldiers, which was such that it was the cause of the ruin of many, it being hardly possible to satisfy both the soldiers and the people. For the people love tranquility, and therefore like pacific princes, but the soldiers prefer a prince of military spirit, who is insolent, cruel, and rapacious. They wish him to exercise these qualities on the people, so that they may get double pay and give vent to their avarice and cruelty. Thus it came about that those emperors who, by nature or art, had not such a reputation as could keep both parties in check, were invariably ruined, and the greater number of them who were raised to the empire, being new men, knowing the difficulties of these two opposite dispositions, confined themselves to satisfying the soldiers, and thought little of injuring the people. This choice was necessary, princes not being able to avoid being hated by someone. They must first try not to be hated by the mass of the people. If they cannot accomplish this, they must use every means to escape the hatred of the most powerful parties, and therefore these emperors, who being new men had need of extraordinary favors, adhered to the soldiers rather than to the people. Whether this, however, was of use to them or not, depended on whether the prince knew how to maintain his reputation with them. From these causes, it resulted that Marcus, Pertinax, and Alexander, being all of modest life, lovers of justice, enemies of cruelty, humane and benign, all came to a sad end except Marcus. Marcus alone lived and died in honor because he succeeded to the empire by hereditary right and did not owe it either to the soldiers or to the people. Besides which, possessing many virtues which made him revered, he kept both parties in their place as long as he lived and was never either hated or despised. But Pertinax was created emperor against the will of the soldiers, who being accustomed to live licentiously under Commodus, could not put up with the honest life to which Pertinax wished to limit them, so that having made himself hated, and to this contempt being added because he was old, he was ruined at the very beginning of his administration. Whence it may be seen that hatred is gained as much by good works as by evil, and therefore, as I said before, a prince who wishes to maintain the state is often forced to do evil, for when that party, whether populace, soldiery, or nobles, 
whichever it be that you consider necessary to you for keeping your position, is corrupt, you must follow its humor and satisfy it, and in that case good works will be inimical to you. But let us come to Alexander, who of such goodness, that among other things for which he is praised, it is said that in the fourteen years that he reigned, no one was put to death by him without a fair trial. Nevertheless, being considered effeminate, and a man who allowed himself to be ruled by his mother, and having thus fallen into contempt, the army conspired against him and killed him. Considering, on the other hand, the qualities of Commodus, Severus, Antonius, Caracalla, and Maximinus, you will find them extremely cruel and rapacious. To satisfy the soldiers, there was no injury which they would not inflict on the people, and all except Severus ended badly. Severus, however, had such abilities that by maintaining the soldiers friendly to him, he was able to reign happily, although he oppressed the people, for his virtues made him so admirable in the sight both of the soldiers and the people that the latter were, in some degree, astonished and stupefied, while the former were respectful and contented. As the deeds of this ruler were great and notable for a new prince, I will briefly show how well he could use the qualities of the fox and the lion, whose natures, as I said before, is necessary for a prince to imitate. Knowing the sloth of the Emperor Julianus, Severus, who was leader of the army in Slavonia, persuaded the troops that it would be well to go to Rome to avenge the death of Pertinax, who had been slain by the Praetorian Guard, and under this pretext, without revealing his aspirations to the throne, marched with his army to Rome and was in Italy before his departure was known. On his arrival in Rome, the Senate elected him emperor through fear and killed Julianus. There remained after this beginning two difficulties to be faced by Severus before he could obtain the whole control of the empire, one in Asia, where Nigrinus, head of the Asiatic armies, had declared himself emperor, the other in the west from Albinus, who also aspired to the empire, and as he judged it dangerous to show himself hostile to both, he decided to attack Negrinus and deceive Albinus, to whom he wrote that having been elected emperor by the senate, he wished to share that dignity with him. He sent him the title of Caesar, and by deliberation of the senate, he was declared his colleague, all of which was accepted as true by Albinus. But when Severus had defeated and killed Nigrinus and pacified things in the east, he returned to Rome and charged Albinus in the Senate with having, unmindful of the benefits received from him, traitorously sought to assassinate him, and stated that he was therefore obliged to go and punish his ingratitude. He then went to France to meet him, and there deprived him of both his position and his life. Whoever examines in detail the actions of Severus will find him to have been a very ferocious lion and an extremely astute fox, and will find him to have been feared and respected by all and not hated by the army, and will not be surprised that he, a new man, should have been able to hold so much power since his great reputation defended him always from the hatred that his rapacity might have produced in the people. But Antonius, his son, was also a man of great ability and possessed qualities that rendered him admirable in the sight of the people and also made him popular with the soldiers, for he was a military man capable of enduring the most extreme hardships disdainful of delicate food and every other luxury which made him loved by all the armies. However, his ferocity and cruelty were so great and unheard of, through his having, 
after executing many private individuals, caused a large part of the population of Rome and all that of Alexandria to be killed, that he became hated by all the world and began to be feared by those about him to such an extent that he was finally killed by a centurion in the midst of his army. Whence it is to be noted that this kind of death, which proceeds from the deliberate action of a determined man, cannot be avoided by princes, since any one who does not fear death himself can inflict it, but a prince need not fear much on this account, as such men are extremely rare. He must only guard against committing any grave injury to any one he makes use of, or has about him for his service, like Antonus had done, having caused the death with contumely of the brother of that centurion, and also threatened him every day, although he still retained him in his bodyguard, which was a foolish and dangerous thing to do, as the fact proved. But let us come to Commodus, who might easily have kept the empire, having succeeded to it by heredity, being the son of Marcus, and it would have sufficed for him to follow in the steps of his father to have satisfied both the people and the soldiers. But being of a cruel and bestial disposition, in order to be able to exercise his rapacity on the people, he sought to favor the soldiers and render them licentious, on the other hand, by not maintaining his dignity, by often descending into the theater to fight with gladiators and committing other contemptible actions, little worthy of the imperial dignity, he became despicable in the eyes of the soldiers, and being hated on the one hand and despised on the other, he was conspired against and killed. There remains to be described the character of Maximinus. He was an extremely warlike man, and as the armies were annoyed with the effeminacy of Alexander, which he have already spoken of, he was elected emperor after the death of the latter. He did not enjoy it for long, as two things made him hated and despised. The one his base origin, as he had been a shepherd in Thrace which was generally known and caused great disdain on all sides. The other, because he had at the commencement of his rule deferred going to Rome to take possession of the imperial seat and had obtained a reputation for great cruelty, having through his prefects in Rome and other parts of the empire committed many acts of cruelty. The whole world being thus moved by indignation for the baseness of his blood, and also by the hatred caused by fear of his ferocity, he was conspired against first by Africa, and afterwards by the Senate and all the people of Rome and Italy. His own army also joined them, for besieging Aquila and finding it difficult to take, they became enraged at his cruelty, and seeing that he had so many enemies, they feared him less, and put him to death. I will not speak of Heliogabalus, of Macrinus, or Julianus, who being entirely contemptible, were immediately suppressed, but I will come to the conclusion of this discourse by saying that the princes of our time have less difficulty than these in being obliged to satisfy in an extraordinary degree, their soldiers in their states. For although they must have a certain consideration for them, yet any difficulty is soon settled, for none of these princes have armies that are inextricably bound up with the administration of the government and the rule of their provinces, as were the armies of the Roman Empire. If it was then necessary to satisfy the soldiers rather than the people, it was because the soldiers could do more than the people. Now, it is more necessary for all princes, except the Turk and the Sultan, to satisfy the people than the soldiers, for the people can do more than the soldiers. I accept the Turk, because he always keeps about him 12,000 infantry and 15,000 cavalry, 
on which depend the security and strength of his kingdom, and it is necessary for him to postpone every other consideration to keep them friendly. It is the same with the kingdom of the sultan, which being entirely in the hands of the soldiers, he is bound to keep their friendship regardless of the people. And it is to be noted that this state of the sultan is different from that of all other princes, being similar to the Christian pontificate, which cannot be called either a hereditary kingdom or a new one, for the sons of the dead prince are not his heirs, but he who is elected to that position by those who have authority. And as this order is ancient, it cannot be called a new kingdom, there being none of these difficulties which exist in new ones, as although the prince is new, the rules of that state are old and arranged to receive him as if he were their hereditary lord. But returning to our matter, I say that whoever studies the preceding argument will see that either hatred or contempt were the causes of the ruin of the emperors named, and will also observe how it came about that, some of them acting in one way and some in another, in both ways there were some who had a fortunate and others an unfortunate ending. As Pertinax and Alexander were both new rulers, it was useless and injurious for them to try and imitate Marcus, who was a hereditary prince, and similarly with Caracalla, Commodus, and Maximinus, it was pernicious for them to imitate Severus, as they had not sufficient ability to follow in his footsteps. Thus a new prince cannot imitate the actions of Marcus in his dominions, nor is it necessary for him to imitate those of Severus, but he must take from Severus those things that are necessary to found his state, and from Marcus those that are useful and glorious for conserving a state that is already established and secure.